and uh, you're most, most welcome. Uh, our speaker tonight, I think, needs no introduction. I think everybody knows the name Willie Nolan, and uh, Willie has been with us in the past. He has spoken to us before on the um, rising in Ballingarry in 1848. Tonight, Willie is going to speak to us on Michael Doheny, who would be Tiberi's first speaker. And uh, it is a taste of what's to come, because Willie is preparing uh, at least one book, if not two, on the Young Ireland. And uh, I think that's going to come in the very, very near future. So we'd be all delighted to hear what Willie has to say tonight, and we will be looking forward to the book. So without further ado, I hand you over to Willie. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary, and I'm delighted to be back in Paris. Yes, I know pretty well, I think, from the past and various goings on here. Um, what I'm going to try and do this evening is to give what I'll call an overview of the life of Michael Dohany. Um, Dohany really is a complex character, like many of the Young Islanders, and he's one of the few who really deserves the epithet Young Ireland or Young Islander because many of the people who were in Ballingarry and not all the Young Islanders were in Ballingarry the only one you could say who was the real Young Islander who was there was uh, William Smith O'Brien many people make the error thinking that Dohany and all of the other Young Islanders were at the rising of William McCormick's house but anyway that's something I'll, I'll, I'll mention as I go through it what I want to do is just give you a flavour of Dohany's early life because he's one of the few young islanders who we can say with certainty came from what is euphemistically known now as the people. And the people, to a certain extent, means the mass of Irish people who either had the status of either tenant farmers, cottiers, or people just living from hand to mouth, a kind of a subsistence um, existence in that period. Now, Dohany belongs to Feathers, and again, there's a bit of confusion. Sometimes Dohany is given to Cashel, and I think it's incorrect, of course, because Dohany was born in Feathers. He's one of the three young islanders who belong to the first decade of the 19th century. And I think this is important because it brings them right through that whole very, very formative period in Irish history. And, of course, it puts them up and puts them against and puts them with one of the greatest political figures I suppose, ever in the history of Ireland, uh, Daniel O'Connell. And these relationships are very important uh, in Dohany's uh, life. Now, Dohany, as I said, belongs then to the tenant farmers. And when you read what he wrote about his family or about his, his situation in life, there's very little ancestry, as we say. In it. For example, if you get John O'Mahony's writings are full of his connections back into Cork, and into Limerick and the Kilbehany district around Mitchellstown. And Smith O'Brien, for example, was full of the glories of his ancestry and his connections with the O'Briens of Tormund, right back to Brian Baru. But Dohany's kind of uh, personal life doesn't really ever become too clear. One of the best sources for it is in 1858 in America, he wrote what he called the autobiography of a, uh, an agitator. He published it in the Irish American. And this is one of the best sources for Tipperary, really, in the early part of the 19th century. Because it's full of the life of the people, which you don't really get much of in a lot of the Young Ireland writing. Because the Young Ireland was basically, sometimes they're dismissed as Dublin 4 today, but they basically were very much middle class. And they had little connection with the world of Dohany to some extent. Now I just want to say something about Dohany came from, as I said, near Feathert. Uh, the town under Fadden Lay, which is close to Feathert. And a few years ago, and I was like, I don't know, was I involved in such, but I might have had some connection with getting a monument erected to him there at his birthplace, just outside Feathert, on, up, off the road to uh, Kilsheelan. I remember Mary Healy, whose book I published, For the Poor and For the Gentry, was instrumental in getting that little, little headstone kind of thing put up. Now, he didn't stay farming, because the farm was sold, and he had three sisters, and the sisters, he said, and I quote from his autobiography, the sisters who were over pious and disinclined to marry, they decided that the farm should be sold and that they should go into some business in the neighbouring town 
where they could attend more closely to their devotions. So we got a lot of this in 19th century Ireland, very much spiritual and pietistic world. And some of the women, even if they didn't have vows of celibacy, they kind of observed very strict devotional rules and didn't wish to get married. Dohany says, then I took my Lily's grammar and went to school. Now the evidence is that Dohany went to school quite late in life. He might have been uh, 15 to 20 years of age when he went to school. And he was schooled at a head school, and he writes about that in his autobiography. The other way, I think, where Dohany kind of made his way in the world, and we're talking about somebody, and it was quite difficult, obviously, at that period, that you could uh, emerge as a political figure, especially in the latter part of the, the 1840s, 50s, and so on, without uh, kind of some background or some uh, foundation. But it wouldn't do to dismiss Dohany as completely of, of uh, an impoverished background or whatever, because all of the young Islanders, when we look at them, every one of them nearly, most of them had priests in the background. And this was very important in shaping their education. Dohany's uncle was a priest, uh, a native of Balangari, and I suppose this kind of ties up with the fact that Dohany may have originated from Balangari, or the family may have originated in Balangari. Now, I was lucky enough a couple of years ago to travel to or go down to look at the church in Dunmanway in West Cork. And in front of that church is a little plaque commemorating Dohany's uncle, who erected the church there in 1836. Now, again, when I come to the, uh, the felon's track, I'll say something briefly about it. Um, you, you can see the reason why Dohany went to West Cork when he was on the run. He was going to his uncle in Dunmanway because he thought he could get away from some of the Cork ports, and that was the reason for his uh, focus on that area. Now, I want to briefly run through Dohany's early life and say something about how he got involved in politics. I think he was a natural speaker. He was a natural auditor. He was also, which was very important in Tipperary, and still is, I think, he was a great athlete. Well, he says so himself anyway, we have no records, we have no, type that he, we have no mileage that he did or anything like that. But in his autobiography, he has a great description of a hurling match. Now, it's one of the few descriptions of a hurling match, and it's rarely ever quoted. And this is something I'm trying to impress upon you about Dohany. He's been a forgotten man in many respects. His, his account of a hurling match is absolutely the best that you can actually get. And I, did, I republished it, or I published it for the historical journal a couple of years ago. So there's some, a lot of things about Dohany which I'm going to try and address, as it were. Now, anyway, he got involved in politics because of, I would say, a natural ability, because also he had been doing some work, as I'll point out again, for the Scully family. And the Scullys, of course, are one of the key political families of Tipperary. You have the Scullys, the Sadliers, the Keatons. All of these families, they're all the graziers of the ranchers of Tipperary and the Mars from Thorlis here, out from the golf club, Tortilla House. They're all major figures in the political life of the repeal movement and even in Catholic emancipation. Now, Downey's first kind of uh, involvement in politics was the election of Thomas Wise for Tipperary in 1832. So he begins his long career when I, you see the way he goes. Um, this is what he says about he was um, campaigning for Wise. He said, I traversed the county, made countless speeches, was chaired in several towns, never undressed. That's for a couple of weeks now wore all my clothes, spent all my money, and killed two black horses for which there was no one to pay. But Wise was returned by a majority of 34. It's not exactly accurate when you look at the figures, but anyway, we'll give Dahani. He's right in 1858. Something that happened in 1832. You might forget it. <coughs> so he'd make a good politician today because he would have great stamina and traverse in the country looking for votes and whatever to talk to people. Now, we just have one account of what Dahani spoke about during his electioneering campaign. And it, was, it was, comes down from about 1867. Someone heard him speak. It says, I heard Mr. Dohany speak that day in Thurles, Temple Moor, and Nina. His speech in each town consisted of a story about a priest preparing a man that was going to be hanged for murder. This man's whole life, as the story had, was one unmixed career of crime. And the priest said to him in amazement, Did you ever in your whole life do one good deed at all? And the culprit, with a brightening up countenance, replied, I did, Your Reverence. I did one good thing, certainly. I shot a proctor. <laughs> so you see, that kind of, this is the life. Dohany has the language of the people, the language of this type of you know, disaffection and kind of uh, 
revolutionary language from an early period. We have a description of Dohany from his one-time bitter enemy, Maurice Lenehan, who was the editor and proprietor of the Tipperary Vindicator. And he's writing in 1867, and again he's remembering back of what Dohany looked like in the 1830s. And this is what he says about him. He was one of the wildest looking beings I had ever hitherto looked upon. He was in apparently 25 or 26 years of age. His hair, which he wore in a bushy way, and which had a natural colour, was a brick red colour. I can't see anyone now with a look around with that hair colour here in the audience. Uh, a brick red colour. His teeth were high, white and well set, and when he smiled or laughed, they showed largely. His features were strongly marked with a rather large mouth and full nasal development. They got very close into people's physiognomy in that period. Um, his expression was sarcastic rather than winning. He wore a tight fitting white or dry trousers, a short black waistcoat, and a brown loose fitting sort out coat, rather out of season. He spoke with much emphasis in a strong brogue and in an out and out fashion. They taught him rather vulgar, but he had great ability and they knew it. Now Lenham doesn't tell us who they are, but I presume he, we think they're Dohany's enemies or whatever. Now, Dohany's life progressed in a sense from that onwards when he got involved in politics with Wise, and then he got mixed up. He moved to Cashel, he sold the farm and feathered, moved to Cashel, and he was involved in a big case in Cashel which made really, you would nearly say, constitutional history in Ireland. Because a group of people, a liberal politicians in, in Cashel, mainly um, uh, Catholics, they brought a case against the people, the Penny Feather family who had kind of taken over Cashel and taken over the common lands of Cashel and had been running it as a personal fiefdom and paying hardly any rent for years and years and years. And they brought a court, a court case against these people in Cashel and Dohany was involved in it. Now, it was an extraordinary case because it, it hinged on a very kind of significant map. And this map was the Down Survey map of 1654. Now, the case was whether to establish whether the common lands and they're in Irish known as C-O-I-T, Quitten, Quitten, the common lands, and in the map it was written C-O-T-Y-N, granted by Archbishop Marianus to the Corporation of Cash in 1230, were the same as the lands now used up and leased by the Pennyfeather family on such favourable terms. Now it's an extraordinary hearing, and it's an extraordinary time to in Irish politics, because at the same time you had a lot of inquiries into how the municipal corporations in Ireland were governed and there was various commissions and inquiries sent around the country to see how they were in, com in, in government. And every one of them, nearly every town, was held by a patron, and they never followed the constitutional rights. They just took the whole thing over, took the common lands over, and all that kind of thing. Now, interestingly enough, the Attorney General at the time, so in 1842, three, he gave the actual decision to Dohany and his men. And he said that the Pennyfeders had unjustly uh, established a hegemony over the common lands of Cashel. And they used the Down Survey map as their proof. Because on the Down Survey map, the common lands were written as C-O-T-Y-N. Now, I suspect it may even have been Dohany who informed the people in the case that this was the name uh, for common lands. Now, Dohany had been involved very much in the Tide campaign, which was one of the great kind of political activities of the early 1830s, up to the end of the 1830s, actually. He was involved in that, and that, again, he made another bit of political... So all politicians, even today, they always have to have a kind of a cause or a case, or, and they always have to be very energetic and flying around the country and going to funerals and various things. Nothing which has changed when you look at Dohany and look at politicians in the contemporary. I think, well, I won't say that, but this is the change I was going to say, the major change, is in their ability in relation to the man I'm talking about, I think, in some respects. I don't want to be making comparisons of contemporary situations. But anyway, anyway Donny got a fee of 42 guineas for representing Cashel Corporation in this case, getting the common lands back. Now, the Corporation of Cashel was then abolished, and a town commission was set up, 21 commissioners, and Dohany was one of the commissioners put onto that. So that he was coming, you can see gradually, Dohany is emerging all the time as a man of substance in his local place. Now, he's, a man also has to watch out and make a successful marriage, as it was the same can be said for a woman, uh, and Dohany kind of did this. In, on 22nd of May 1837, he married Mary Jane O'Dwyer. 
Now I noticed in the DIB, which is the Encyclopedia of Irish Learning, in the DIB she's given as Ellen Odewire, which is incorrect because Ellen Odewire was a sister of Mary Jane Odewire, but that's a bit of pedantry. Um, now the Odewires were a very significant family in kind of the Emily kind of Latin area of Tipperary. And I was particularly grateful to the late Liam O'Dear for giving me a lot of information on the background to the O'Dwyers and the family. She was daughter of Morgan O'Dwyer, just as a piece of Cullen and West Tipperary. Morgan O'Dwyer's wife was daughter of General Sheehy Keating of Banshee Castle. So that Mary Jane Dohany's antecedents on both her paternal and maternal side were incorporated into imperial governments and a Hibernal Norman inheritance as her family claimed kinship with Geoffrey Keaton or Chaperone Keaton, the 17th century historians. But the other wires and the Keatings had been integrated into the colonial system. So in this way, Con uh, Dohany had a foot in the camp of the establishment. Which you, really, you always have to have a foot in the camp of the establishment. It's not always, you'll never succeed too much if you stay on uh, the outside. So he was partly in and partly out of it all. Now the other wires had made a lot of money for supplying horses to the army during the Napoleonic Wars. And in our time, in this first, especially in the First World War and the Crimean War, I remember Willie Smith telling me that for the first time ever in Ireland after the Crimean War, farmers started uh, having powers because they'd sold a lot of horses for the Crimean War, the British Army, and the same thing in the, in the, in the front. But this time here, Morgan de Wilde now makes his money. Now, the important thing about this is Mrs. Daphne's uncle, General Sir Sheehy, Henry Sheehy Keating was governor of Mauritius. So they came from a fairly distinguished family. And they were again part of that grazier network of um, uh, Tipperary. Now one thing that I think must have been significant for Dohany in uh, sorting out his finances or giving him a good kind of financial background was there was a legal case about the will of a Roger Sheehy Keaton who died in 1813, his wife's maternal uncle. Now, Dohany represented his wife in this case and represented the not inconsiderable sum, this was in the 1840s, of 876 pounds, six and troubles. So, there's a fair bit of money now when you think of the 1840s. So, this probably could have set him up and maybe uh, built the fine house for him, Alia Eileen, uh, which still exists in, um, in Cashel. Now, one of the things that I think I should emphasise, and it's, uh, as I go through the talk, I mentioned some of the sources I've been using. Uh, one of the much neglected sources now, I think, for the history of 19th century Ireland, is what's known as the Devon Commission, which was the commission chaired by the Earl of Devon in 1843-4, to kind of um, analyse the relationship between landlord and tenant in Ireland. Now, Dohany is one of the few young Irelanders to actually give evidence to the Devon Commission, and he gave his evidence in Cashel. And I've looked through a lot of the Devon Commission, and I think it's one of the most powerful and the most evocative kind of statements right through the whole Commission. Now, it's interesting to see Dohany is beginning to regard himself as a person of consequence, because he comes into the Devon Commission in Cashel. Now, the best way, in a sense, to do a lecture like this is to have a kind of a dramatised version of it, and to think about Dohany walking into Cashel and the town hall or whatever, on 30 September 1844, and he was asked what he was. And he said he was resident in Cashel, a barrister, the summer half year. You know, this is a kind of a an Anglo kind of thing to say that. I'm resident in Tipperary the summer half year and in Dublin for the remainder of my time. Um, he was chairman of the Cashel Board of Guardians and treasurer rent receiver of the new town commissioners. His office in Dublin was at 19 Dominic Street, Upper. Now, one of the things about Dohany's evidence is that he gave a very vivid account, particularly of one murder. And that was the murder of the killing of um, James Vincent Scully, who was related to the Scullys, who were the famous uh, graziers, major landowners, and also very much connected, of course, Dennis Scully was Daniel O'Connell's. Uh, right hand man. Donny kind of always intimated he knew more about rural Ireland than anybody else. He told the commissioners of conspiracies to assassinate landlords fashioned at Shebeen houses, hurling matches and fairs by people who sometimes were strangers but bound by a good feeling towards each other. Now we get a very detailed account of the murder of James Vincent Scully. 
and it caused Dohany a certain amount of trouble both then and afterwards in his political life in Tipperary. I don't want to go into this in detail, but just want to draw your attention to it. He maintained that Scully's murder was related to the letting of a 22-acre Irish acre field to potato jobbers in April 1841 at £14 pounds per Irish acre as it was prized virgin tiller ground. The ground was then divided into 55 lots and sublet at an enormous profit rent. One acre could produce approximately 14 tonnes of potatoes, worked on the market some £400. Now we're talking about the 1840s here. But the harvest of potato, like all crops, was weather dependent, and the jobbers were unable, because of the wet weather and waterlogged ground, to take out their potatoes. Scully, anxious to restore the field to grazing, processed the tenants for possession. They refused, and Dohany said, Having obtained the decrees, Scully dug the potatoes and put his own horses to them and drew them out on the road and spilled them on the road and also let his bullocks into the field. So you can see there might have been a certain amount of animosity towards James Vincent Scully. Now he's supposed also to have evicted tenants and various other things. Now he gives a wonderful description here. Well, it's a very unbelievable description. Really. He had been shot at in April 1841. And remember now, Scully was a Catholic landlord. And Donny told the commission... He went out the very night he was fired at. The shot that was fired at him hit him in the cheek. It was a leaden spoon which lodged in his mouth, and he went out to look for them. He was a tough man, you can see. It was rather owing to the extraordinary spirit of resistance and daring them that the murder was committed. Now, one of the other Scullies, after was a, an MP for Tipperary, Vincent Scully, he was very annoyed, of course, at Dohany's evidence and the, the evidence against him. And he said, he kind of uh, wrote an addenda to the actual uh, Devon Commission. And he said, some of his neighbours and tenants that were supposed to be ill-disposed were spirited on against him in a most improper manner. My allusion will be understood in the quarter it refers to. So obviously he was implying that it was Dohany. Now he goes into the fact that Dohany and James Vincent Scully didn't go on too well. But he has this extraordinary information, and again it ties into Tipperary history. He says, when my brother and I were taught from school in England, now I remember all the large Catholic farmers were educated in England, um, we found him at Kilfekel, as we found Dohany at Kilfekel, acting as a private tutor to our youngest brother. Now the youngest brother was Willem Scully, some of you probably have heard about him. Subsequent on our return, he left the family. Now, of course, Willem Scully is the famous um, Willem Scully of uh, Ballycoohy fame, and Dohany was his tutor in Willem Scully's early life. So there's a connection which cuts across a lot of ground in relation uh, to Ireland. Now, one of the things, Dohany was very involved with the repeal organisation, very involved with um, um, Daniel O'Connell. But for whatever reason, which I won't go into here, he moved to the Young Ireland side and to the Nation newspaper. And especially when all the difficulties with the repeal movement, particularly there was difficulties about accounting, have we heard that before? Difficulties about accounting and where did all the money that O'Connell collected, where did that go to? There was difficulties about the education. All the various animosities which have kept coming up in Irish history, subsequently even today, were there in... Uh, Dohany's time. Now the Young Ireland kind of major figure in the period and Dohany's hero all his life really was Thomas Davis. And Dohany was here in Thalvis organising a meeting to commemorate the Liberator's um, freedom from jail. Remember the Liberator was jailed in 1844 for attempting to have a kind of a meeting at Clontaff and all of that. And then the year afterwards they were always having these commemorative meetings. There was one in Thalvis which Dohany organised. He had hoped to have it in Cashel, but the, the, the O'Connell faction, as I call them, turned him down and decided to have the meeting instead in Thornless, instead of uh, Cashel. And the meeting was held down where the Palatine College entrance is now, at Smee's Corn Store. Not so much the meeting as the actual banquet at the meeting. But at the meeting, this was in uh, September 1845. But the day of the meeting and the day that O'Connell was coming on this, Dohany got a letter from Dublin, written by a man named um, David Kangley. Now, I've never kind of tied up where David Kangley, but he's, a ca he's from Cashin, 
I presume the families may have died out in Cashel now, David Kangley. And I can, when I read this letter, you can see the kind of animosity that was rising in between the young Alamers and between O'Connor, the jealousies, animosities, various other things. And Kangley, now this letter has never been read in public before, so you're, 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 it's a first. Um, because it's, it's, it was in Dohany's uh, archive when that was taken in 1848. A lot of the letters which I've used in this, they would never have been found otherwise, only for they were captured when Dohany was arrested. Or, well, when the house was searched, he wasn't arrested. And the letter reads, Tuesday morning, 16th of September, 1845. This is when Thomas Davis died. And he's writing to Dohany and Thurlis. He said, you must prepare yourself, my dear friend, for an intelligence the most afflicting you can imagine, which quite stupefied myself not more than an hour ago. Our dear and esteemed and most valued friend, he who has lost you in the plural is the worst calamity that could befall this unfortunate land is no more. Need I name him? I'm sure I need not. I know your own heart and your own apprehensions have already suggested to you the name of Davis. For my own part, this announcement stunned and stupefied me and then drew from me the bitterest tears I ever shed. I had heard not a word of his being ill. I got a car to drive to Baggett Street and found the story too true. At half past six this morning he expired. I am greatly apprehensive that the malignant spirit of the vile creatures who so unjustly assailed him will occasion to triumph, and that their odious and damnable bigotry will exultantly point to his lamentable death as a visible interposition of providence in favour of their hateful system of exclusion. Now, if somebody died young who was very active in politics in that period in Ireland, it would be seen as a mark of the Lord's disfavour. So this is what he said about Davis, the problems with the way they were thinking about Davis. The funeral is to take place on Thursday morning, the burial to take place in Mount Jerome. And if you go to Mount Jerome, in Harold's Cross in Dublin, you will see the grave of Thomas Davis. Very, very simple stone, very pining kind of a place. Now, that was a major kind of disaster in a sense for young Ireland and for the nation and for Ireland in general, the early death of Davis, which has happened with many young people in some respects. Davis was to some extent sanctified and right through the kind of period that we're, you'll be familiar with, right through the early 20th century, Davis was regarded as one of the founding figures of Irish nationalism. Now, it is sometimes forgotten that, of course, Davis's great kind of um, belief was that Ireland politics should become non-sectarian in Ireland and should bring together the orange and the green together as I mean, Mars flag. But that was sometimes seen in a different sense. Now, you can see there was a lot of bitterness between O'Connell, between the repeal movement, and between Dohany's group in Young Ireland. I don't need to go into it, but Dohany was sidelined in Tipperary. And you can see at the various meetings, particularly the clergy were very much against him because he had, been, he had said various things about repeal, he had said various things about Dohany. Now he's writing to his brother in um, 1846, 10th of July 1846, he's writing to his brother James. And again there's a quotation in this which shows the bitterness and the animosity between the Ireland. Now this wouldn't have been said in public obviously. That's the benefit of having private correspondence. He's on about usurers in famine food, people buying up food and storing it and selling it at exorbitant prices. And he said, would that an equal fate befell the usurers in politics. It amused me of all things to hear of Daniel O'Connell's sacrifices. And what usurer ever hoarded for a famine time with such advantage? He sacrifices 5,000 a year, the highest thing any government had to bestow. To 20,000 exactly. And they call this a sacrifice, and gaping crowds attest its truth by a fierce foray. That should be raised elsewhere, but no matter, we are not fit for freedom. And God can tell if we ever will be. This was a constant refrain of nationalist Ireland, especially in some, some respects, physical force Ireland, that we weren't fit for freedom. We weren't fit to take any kind of, uh, kind of action. So we're moving on then to look at other aspects of the Confederation policy and other aspects of Dohany's. Now, one of the things which again ties me to Tipperary is that in um, 7th of September in 1847, Dohany writes to William Smith O'Brien. The purpose of his letter is to have a tenant right meeting in Holy Cross. Now, it's one of the first tenant right meetings ever held, probably in Ireland, I think, 
and the beginnings really of the tenant right movement. And the orchestrator of this tenant right meeting was the very famous, one of the most famous of all Irishmen, regarded by Pierce and all that as one of the four horsemen. And I'm talking about James Fenton Lawler. Now, James Fenton Lawler and Donnie didn't get on very well. A lot of them, none of them got on very well. Desmond Ryan said, as I'll come to it later, the Fenians, he said, fought in America, they were like a bag of cats, he said. They fought so hard and they fought so much against another. Now, Don is writing to Smith O'Brien saying, should we bother with this fellow Don, or uh, Lala? Should we bother with this meeting? But if we don't bother with it, we might lose the tenant farmers. You know, it might go well, it might go wrong. We should perhaps be there. Although it didn't do any good, it didn't. The Holy Cross thing was a little bit of a, a disaster. Now, I just want to give, read you Dahani's description of Lala. By the way, I never was so much surprised as by the appearance of this said Mr. Lala. I could not be persuaded that I had before me in a poor, distorted, ill favoured humpbacked little creature, the bold propounder of the singular doctrines of the nation letters. Now, Lawler had done all this thing, Ireland, the land from the sea to the, all that kind of thing, uh, and, and the Carilla land. Was. His manners, too, is just as strange as his person, but he's shrewd and full of reflection, and expect, except that his extreme sensitiveness and his little attribute of deformity may mar his good sense. I think he may turn out a practical and useful agitator. Well, that was very uh, prophetic from Dahani in that situation. Now, Dahani in Holy Cross, he was a politician in many respects. He said he was used to holding the plough at Holy Cross. Now, a couple of months later, at a meeting of what we called the Irish Council in Dublin, and I'll uh, read you out. He said, he told the, this was a landlord come liberal Catholic body, he told him, I have the management of an estate in the south of Ireland, because he was managing the estate for the town commissioners in Cashel. And he was very much speaking as if he was a landlord. Now he talks about his own situation. A lot of the activists, a lot of the people involved in uh, land agitation and they were looking for uh, um, tenurial status and a lot of the opposition to that was they said it should make the whole pauperised tenantry, especially in Connacht, if you give two acre farms perpetuity, you're going to have perpetuity in poverty forever. But Donny now outlines his own experience in respect of the corporation of casual property. It belongs to the corporation of the town with which I am connected and it was on my suggestion that the tenant right was adopted. And what has been the result? The consequence is that within the present year, I have received rent for land which the tenants would be utterly unable to pay did the tenant right not exist. And in every instance where a farm had been purchased, all the arrears have been paid up. Nay, more in every instance where tenures have been disposed of, they have been purchased by neighbouring farmers. And the necessary consequence is, is that in many cases, five, six and seven holdings have been merged into one farm. And this is a record you probably all are uh, familiar with uh, in many respects. Now, I'm not going to... We move on then, in a sense, and we move on into the foundation of the Irish Confederation in January 1847, and their attempt, ill-fated attempt in many respects, uh, at insurrection in um, July 1848, which was really... I won't say it was a half-hearted attempt, but it wasn't very well organised, and they just hadn't kind of got the, the equipment, they hadn't the arms, they hadn't the organisation, and there was great opposition within the, the nationalist circles, if you could say the repeal movement, which is nearly dead in the water then, against it. So Barangari and Farron Rory, in a sense, was in some respects accidental, but it wasn't accidental in terms of its impact on Irish history subsequently. And really, in a sense, the second part of my lecture, which begins now, is going to be devoted to that post-1848 and how it impacted. Because one of the things the Rising did, it forced some of the greatest talents that we ever had in this country. And you need only go and look at the monument in the Commons in Ballingarry and read their names. It forced them out of the country. And just think if all these people... Now, Mitchell had gone previously... But if all these people had remained in Ireland, if they'd been given responsibility in Ireland, they would have made this a wonderful... I think myself, I'm, we can't be sure of these things, but I'm just saying that anyway, because about 13 or 14 of them who were in the Commons on the 28th of July. And when you read their names, 
They're kind of all over the world now. They've made an impact all over the world. Well, particularly, I should say, the English-speaking world. We don't see many of them in Brazil or places like that. So I think it was, in many respects, a major disaster. Not for, for any kind of country to have its best of its people pushed from it, and it, it, it became the general kind of atmosphere. Now, Dahani doesn't get involved. He's involved in 48, but he's not involved in the way he would have liked. He wasn't at Farron Rory, he wasn't at Killinall, he wasn't in Mullinahone, so he was in none of the military little bits and pieces that went on during... Now, there is some evidence that there was great disagreement between Dohany and Smith O'Brien in relation to how the campaign was being handled around Ballingarry and Mullinahone. And then there was great controversy afterwards because it was implied that Dahani had invited O'Brien and the Young Islanders, or the Irish Confederation, to Barangari and to Tipperary because he said it was so well organised. And then when they came to Cashel, there was nobody there. Nobody waiting for them. No organisation. And this was the whole thing. And afterwards he was forced to write, when he escaped to America, he was forced to write explaining that he never had promised O'Brien all of these men and all of this. So there was a lot of retribution which comes after every rising, I think. You know, who was in the GPO and who wasn't and why they weren't. And what did they do in 1916, what they didn't do. Anyway, Dahani's great escape novel, or not a novel, historical narrative, The Felon's Track is probably one of the best exemplars of topographical writing in 19th century Ireland. Because it has all of the kind of material about descriptions of the country and the people. Now, strangely enough, in The Felon's Track, there's no reference whatsoever in 1848. There's no reference to the famine or hardly any reference to the famine in 1848 in the Felon's Track. But it's a wonderful description of the mountains, Mount Mallory, it's a wonderful description of the Cork, southwest Cork countryside, and his interaction with the people. The other thing is interesting is that Dohany was probably an Irish speaker, a native Irish speaker. There's only two references in the whole Felon's Track to the Irish language. And that's one of them where he's listened to a lady from Stephen Stevens or staying near Gugan Barra on the Abantry, and they're listening to the lady of the house and she's telling her husband that these guys could be worth a few bob, Dohany and Stevens. But she's talking in Irish, you see. She didn't realise that Dohany knew Irish. That's one of the few examples. But it's a wonderful book. I'm not going to go into this work. There's probably two lectures sometime in, in the uh, Felon's track. The other thing that's very interesting about Felon's track, it does a lot about the diet. Now, he doesn't often talk about getting potatoes in the houses. It's always uh, fresh milk. And around Kerry and Gugan Barron, these places, it's fresh salmon. But one time, and this is quite unique in our dietary, maybe anybody here who has experience of this maybe can tell us, is that um, one morning he got up around that area of Gugan Barron, Seven Stevens, and they had a breakfast of fried badger. Now, if anybody here has eaten badger, a fried badger, so it must have been good. And that was part of the thing. But it's a wonderful book, and it was published in New York in 1849. Now, he's dependent on Stevens for the account of what happened at Farben Rory. Because Stevens was, as, was at Farben Rory, as was McManus, and as was William Smith O'Brien. So, as I said in the beginning, there was only one really young islander at Farben Rory. Stevens wasn't really a young islander. McManus was in, working in England. He was a kind of a young Irlander, but wasn't really in the set. So O'Brien, O'Brien never claimed to be a young Irlander, strangely enough. So it's kind of mixed up. The historians always say the young Irlander rising of 1848, and the record shows it was by no means a young Irlander rising. It was the rising, maybe, of the Irish Confederation, but there's a lot of other things there. I'm not going to do. Anyway, then, I'm going to now move on to Dahani in America, because this is really... Like, um, now, this is a wonderful little book. It's a, a narrative of uh, one of the young islanders, who John Dillon's, uh, his name is Charles Hart, brother-in-law of John Blake Dillon, and all that Dillon dynasty. And he was sent to America in 1848. Again, they had an American wing, as it were, of the repeal and the Young Island Movement Confederation to raise funds and all that. But he didn't do very much in that line. But he does give a very good account of New York in the period. And what he's very good at is all of the Young Islanders, Irish Confederates, coming into America and they're meeting various people. And from page 43, I'll quote, and this is writing the 24th of January 1849. 
On Sunday morning about a month ago, just as J.D., as John Dillon, M.O.F. and I were going out to Mass, in walks Michael Donny. Now, Donny has gone to France, and back to America, blooming after a sojourn in France and long sea voyage. After Mass, we dined together. It was at first red hot about the priests, but from the tone we took, and when he helped with the sort of fix in which Darcy McGee then was on to his contest with the bishop, changed his tune. A few nights he had an opportunity to display his eloquence at a dinner for a military company. He talked about 20,000 pikes, etc., all of which, of course, was true. Since then, at the Bergen and Rhine dinner, he made an eloquent but in many parts and true speech, and as we are told, has been constantly, or at least frequently, drinking. Now, this is one of the first references we get to Tahani's uh, drinking, and it seems to be an affliction that a number of the young Islanders suffered from in exile, as we led to believe anyway. And now this is, Donny was a, a kind of anti-clerical to a great extent, especially after the rising, and he must remain to a certain extent like that. Now if heart goes on, last Sunday night he said, Bishop Hughes invite us to supper, and also Donny, not however by our introduction. So all the time he's distancing himself, Donny is not our class. He came quite tipsy and behaved in a very disgusting manner, brawling and disputing with Mr. Brownson, who was an American author, and treating the bishop with a rude and vulgar familiarity. Now, you wouldn't treat Bishop Hughes with a rude and, because he was a fairly tough man himself. We naturally felt ashamed, though it was impossible not to laugh. This coupled with his unhandsome and false insinuations and statements about Smith O'Brien have met us resolved not even to have pity on him for the future. The Americans who have met him seem to see through him pretty clearly. So you can see that Dohany's reputation among the kind of more middle class, upper middle class young Islanders was kind of not exactly in the best uh, flavour. Now, in 1858, in the St. Patrick's Day, uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood was formed in Lombard Street in Dublin. The major figure in its formation and its subsequent history in Ireland uh, was James Stevens. And Stevens is a very, very significant character um, in Irish history. And this man here thinks he was one of the greatest organisers ever. And this man has temporary connections, of course. Um, this is uh, Desmond Ryan's biography of James Stevens. Desmond Ryan's father, I think, was a native of Lockmore, County Tipperary, Kingston, uh, County Tipperary. Now, F uh, Stevens had founded, with the others, the Fenian movement, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and that became known as the Fenian Brotherhood in America. Um, the major figure in America, the major figures in America, were John O'Mahony and. Um, Michael Dohany. Now, when Dohany and O'Mahony and all of the young Islanders went to America, they all had a pretty strong hatred of England and of the English establishment, the English administration. And really, what they started off doing was what they wanted, of course, was revenge. Now, you can see Dohany, his whole family went with him, of course, even his sister Eileen, uh, or his sister in law Eileen. They all went uh, to America, so whole families moved out after 1848. And this is something which is totally forgotten about by historians, by everybody else. There was an enormous immigration of very talented people apart from the leaders. Ordinary people in Ballingarry went. For example, I got a letter uh, in O'Brien's documents from a James McCormack, who had been appointed a lieutenant colonel by Smith O'Brien in Ballingarry. And he wrote back to O'Brien in 1858 from America, saying how well he had done. And he had one great phrase in it, which probably only a Balangari man would probably say. He said he had left the short shovel behind him, and he now was a clerk in the railway in New Jersey. But the sad thing about it, and this is where exile we think today, we kind of sometimes think of it too uh, flippantly. You can come back on a plane, etc., etc. Exile for then, then was a permanent thing. And the pining thing about McCormack's letter to O'Brien was, he said if there was any situation for him to be got in Ireland, he would love to come home and die in Ireland. And of course, the man never 
uh, came back to Ireland. Now, Stephen's greatest ability really was as an organiser. He travelled Ireland in the 1850s, organising this secret organisation. Now, remember, the Young Ireland and Irish Confederation movement was totally transparent. They had a paper, everything was published on it. They nearly told everybody we were going to have a rising. You know what I mean? We're going, where we're going to be, how many men we have, how many clubs we have. The Fenians depended on utter secrecy and total kind of um, the, way the, the, the way it was set up with the circles and everything else. That very few people knew what was happening at the top level. And that became kind of the model for Irish revolutionary uh, bodies in the subsequent period. Now, the one thing, Stevens, of course, was a Kilkenny man. Reputedly, he was an engineer of some sorts. But he was a very tough man uh, to deal with. He set himself up in the beginning as a provisional dictator, as he called himself. He wanted to have complete charge of organising Ireland. Now, the one thing he wanted from America was money. And, of course, that's the one thing probably we all wanted from America in our early days <laughs> was money. But he wanted money and he wanted men. And the idea was um, um, O'Mahony and Dohany, by training militia in New York and all over San Francisco and various places, would eventually send money every month to Stevens in Dublin, but they also would make plans to send an army back to Ireland. And this army would lead the Fenians in Ireland to successful revolution. Now this became critical at the time of the American Civil War. And the American Civil War is a double-edged sword for the Fenians. Because first of all, it will give them the military training they need. But I don't think, like every war, they didn't realise that the American Civil War was going to go on so long and it was, it was going to be sort of um, much of a killing field for the Fenians. Because some of their best men were killed. Some of the best military men of the Fenians, like uh, Michael Corcoran when he fell off a horse. Very places like that. Do you know what I mean? Some of the best of the Fenian people were supposed to come back to Ireland. Now, a great number of them did come back to Ireland in the 1860s. But again, it kind of petered out. It wasn't very well organised and various things. So Dohany was at this work in America. Now, one of the interesting accounts, and I like to kind of uh, look at Dohany, look at the human aspect of their life and how they were getting on. Uh, Stevens went to America in 1858, in the end of 1858. And really, he wanted to go to America to get money because he believed there was a fund set up in 1848 which people in New York had control of, and Stevens wanted to get this. And he wanted to get John Mitchell to write to New York to get him this money and all of that. But it didn't work out because none of the major figures of the Young Islanders got on very well with Stevens. Mitchell didn't get on with him. And, uh, Dohany didn't get on with him. And there was a lot of jealousy and for infighting. Now, he went to visit Dohany in New York, and we get a sense of Dohany's circumstances in New York in this period. Um, Stevens was a bit worried that Dohany was obstructing his role in America, Stevens' role. But you can see, of course, Dohany had been in America for a number of years, and he felt he was this kind of young man coming in, Stevens, trying to be, take over the whole organisation. And this is what he writes about Dohany, and he also complained, now this is ten years after, nearly ten years after the book was written, he also complained that Dohany hadn't mentioned him enough in the felon's track. So you got a lot of human elements throughout this. But judging of me by the little his absurd egoism allowed him to see of me in 48, he laid, and perhaps still lays, the flattering unction to his soul that I might be done for. Now, Stephen's trying to think of Dohany was out to get him, kill him. You see, the point is, Stevens was relegating Dohany to a kind of an inferior role in America. And he was putting him behind Mitchell, Maher and O'Mahony. Now he describes how Dohany's oldest son, Dohany had two sons and a daughter, his oldest son Morgan, a youth of no striking appearance, appearance and ungracious bearing, had on hearing his Stevens name received him with commendable indifference. I'm trying to think of a great phrase, you could often try. Commendable indifference at Dohany's legal office. He then visited Dohany's residence in the suburb of Gowanus and described the family circle. Mrs. D. I had seen but once before in 48, but for a short time. 
So that had but an indistinct recollection of her. She received me with enthusiasm, not to say reverence. Miss O'D, that's Dahani's sister-in-law, reception was less demonstrative, but not less kind. She has greatly changed in appearance, grown warm and old. Beside the youth I had seen at the office, there was another boy and a little girl. The boy was the image of his father, though more morally and mentally than in face or person. The little girl was so slight and frail and fair to, that at the first glance she seemed a mild little ambassadress from Elfinland of the spirit people. Now this is, Stevens was very acerbic in his um, statements, and he describes Donnie's house in this suburb of New York. Donnie's house, though out of the way, is pleasant enough situated. Its exterior appearance too is good enough for so desperate a rebel, and the room into which we were first ushered had some claim to comfort, order, and even taste. After a while, however, we descended to what through courtesy is here called the basement, but which is nothing more or less than the cellar, fitted up as a sitting or dining room. Now, he was very critical. Stevens had spent a lot of time in Paris, and he was very critical of New York and all this noble, rich architecture he kind of uh, saw everywhere. Now, the Fenian movement, as I said, developed in America. It developed in Ireland. And the major kind of um, activity in Ireland was... Um, Sorry, you battery run down. Yeah. Uh, the major activity in 18, November 1881 was the burial of... Now, Donnie, of course, had been involved in organising the funeral to New York. McManus is one of the few Irish people to have been buried twice. He was first buried in San Francisco, and then they decided to um, disinter the body and carry it, carry it up to New York, when they sailed, when they shipped to New York, received it in New York with great pomp and ceremony, and with all these militias and all these people in it. And then they brought him on the ship into Cove, and from Cove by Limerick Junction, and Thurlis, I suppose, up to Dublin. And then you had a big row with uh, Cardinal or Archbishop Cullen at the time, not allowing him to rest in the pro cathedral in Dublin. A bit like what happened to him afterwards in Thurlis. But um, that's uh, another hill. Donny came and gave a description of all of the activities of the Irish American. Now, shortly before that, <coughs> Donny wrote a very perceptive letter, which I won't have time to go into now to uh, William Smith O'Brien in 1858. And he began the letter, he said, it's 10 years since we last met, the last met in the Commons, 28th of July, 1848. So he was writing to him 10 years later. He was slightly iffy with Smith O'Brien. On the one hand, O'Brien's great status kind of impinged on all the relationships of the young Islanders with him. But on the other hand, because O'Brien had condemned secret societies and the Fenians, Dohany would have been a little bit um, against them in many respects. One of the things that um, O'Donoghue did, and they went through a whole range of things like slavery in America, and this is something that I'm going to try and bring out in my uh, book when I bring it out, is to show that O'Donoghue was an intellectual and thinking person. He's dismissed by a lot of the New Islanders as just a, a kind of a rough country guy with a bro. But he was thinking all the time. He was a major figure, of course, in relation to the, the Irish language. And I know Donald O'Dear here would know plenty about that. And he had, which, he had helped O'Mahony translate Chaharun's Caton for a in 1858 in New York. And this is an extraordinary labour of love by Dohany and O'Mahony as exiles. Now, in relation to the land question, because O'Brien was very much the paternalistic landlord in his estate, I think there is only one remedy, Dohany said, it's extension. If I were now in Ireland and power to do it, this would be my plan. Now listen to this, because this exactly happened in 1903, 4. I would summon a convention, I think to my mind, perfectly practical, notwithstanding the statutes. And I would submit to it one question. How can Irish land be abolished with least injustice to the owners of the land? I would forward on that basis a scheme in limiting the quantity of land which a man could hold in his own hands, and equalising farms on such a scale that the land would be brought within the reach of all. This is one of the most precise and preceptive antidotes or whatever to the land situation ever in Ireland. Now he gives a very kind of um, emotive 
um, account of his own life to O'Brien. And it's very poignant. You've got to think this man in exile, losing everything in cash, his house, his job, his status, going to America where he's dismissed as a rowdy, and a drunkard, and fighting with the other young islanders, and knocking them down cellars, and all sorts of things, and all of that. But here you see in this, you see the kind of impact of exile. For my personal affairs are not much to be spoken of. I would have done very well if I devoted myself exclusively to my profession as Dylan and O'Gorman. They were strong legal men. But I was busy with the military and the old hope and old cause, and I now busy myself in endeavouring to reanimate the Gaelic. And this is one of the key works of O'Mahony and Dahani in America. They published material in the Irish language, which is priceless today. They published poetry, they published kind of summaries and sentences of poetry and kind of notes to it. And I'm sure Irish scholars and Dan Finnan here probably knows and have looked at all of this and will be able to expound on it for us. Um, he says, we have been able, however, to live comfortably enough but simply way out of the world. I have no associations with anyone but O'Mahony. He and I are always together and we eat away our hearts in bitter memories and bitterer hopes. Mar mixes with the world, as Thomas Francis, and enters into it its feelings and aspirations. Of Mitchell I know nothing but what I read in the paper. O'Gorman is reformed and lion and sharp as a chisel and equally keen in his race for money. Now these are the people who were all like that one time. We meet and salute and that's all. My sole amusement and relaxation consists in reading and translating Gaelic ballads and discussing them with O'Mahony twice a week or oftener. And this is a sad bit about it. I would like to be gay and happy, but I cannot. My days are becoming shorter and shorter. And between me and thee, my hope is fast disappearing and a dark horizon closing in and in. Oh, it is a sad thing to be dust to sing in the hills so far away from all the sympathizers that fed and fired one's youth. It is a terrible thought that one must lie down to sleep at last in foreign style. And yet, methinks, that with me at least it is better so. I doubt if I could stain, sustain the sight of Ireland now. So there you have an extraordinary kind of evocation of what it meant for a thinking man to be in exile away from his home. Now I'll just finish up because I know I'm traveling on a bit too much. Um, Donny, when he came to McManus's funeral, on the 12th of November, the day after the funeral of Terence Billy McManus, this delegation from America, including Dahani and Mrs. Dahani, went by train to Salins and from there to the grave of Bull Tone at Bordenstown. The connections are absolutely incredible when you think about it. Um, and he gave a number of lectures. One of the lectures he gave was in Cashel, which again I'd love to have been at in some respects. He travelled to Gould's Cross County Parade by train and from there he was accompanied by a large concourse of people in a band to the hall in the Mechanics Institute. It must have been a bittersweet occasion for his first time back since he abandoned his career, his home and family to travel the felon's track in 48. Now he had to be careful because he was still on the run, technically. He could have been arrested, and, but the British didn't want to bother, they just wanted to keep things quiet. Now the one thing that is um, striking about him, there was no Catholic clergy president at that meeting. I have come, he told his audience, among you people of Cashel, where I had many a call, many a fight and many a triumph over your enemies. His lecture was replete with folklore and some acute observations on the similarity of the stone in the Romanesque Cormac's Chapel in the Round Tower, stone that was not found in the vicinity of Cashel. Now maybe Don O'Regan might be able to tell us about the stone in the Round Tower and uh, the Cormac's Chapel came from, but he discovered this. And this he says about Ireland, but Ireland is no more, there is no Ireland now except in the hearts of a few brave youths opinions, who in spite of every difficulty in the face of every peril through all time and under any circumstance, come what may and where it may, are determined to write this old land yet. And again the exile and disposition comes into it, and the, the kind of poignancy of the whole thing. And he talked in Cashel, I once thought that my days would decline under the shadow of the rock. I built me the small house there within the lines of its beauty, and how many a nice and the moon was smiling behind its softened majesty did I gaze upon its rapturous grandeur. And how often did I think that it would be glorious to die with the impress of its beauty shadowing the golden veil as the last vision might fall upon my soul as it floated in another world in peace. It must not be. 
And now it comes to that country where my two children are fighting for the flag which gave their present shelter. I have vowed that unless this country has suffered its independence, no child of mine shall ever live in it. Now we give another, another lecture, but I don't want to really uh, talk about that. Um, his final years, there wasn't much left to Dahani really after his um, time in Ireland. He disagreed with um, all of the young Islanders, disagreed with Smith O'Brien, and he gave some lectures in, Pennsylvania, or in uh, Philadelphia and various places in the last year of his life. Now, then, the March 62, he fell ill of fever, and Michael Donnie died at his home, 18th Street, near 8th Avenue in Brooklyn, on 1st of April, 1862. He was 57 years of age. And again, you find, well, for people of my age, of course, now, you find that all of the young Islanders died relatively young. And this is one of the sad things about, and of course, a lot of them ascribe the, the fact of all this movement around the world. He was a lieutenant colonel of the 69th Regiment and colonel of the 75th Regiment. After a solemn high mass celebrated St. John's Catholic Church by Father McGovern, Morgan Dahani, the seized eldest son and an officer in the 69th Regiment, led a procession to Calvary Cemetery. The Boston pilot gave the order of the cartridge as follows. Officers of the 69th Regiment in carriages, officers of the Phoenix Brigade in carriages, that was the brigade Dahani set up, men of 48 in carriages, citizens in carriages. The 48 men included John O'Mahony, Patrick O'Dea Radkeel, Richard O'Gorman, John Purcell of Carrie, Michael Hannon, John Savage, John D. Hughes, and Captain John Cabinet, who was wounded at the War House, and was to die in the American Civil War at the Battle of Antietam. The coffin was lowered by the exiles that stood around the grave in silent sadness, gazing down into it as each shovel full of clay fell with a hollow knife on the coffin. More poignancy was added to the occasion when the coffin containing the remains of his youngest and best beloved child was taken from its grave and deposited with the father. This was Jane, the frail little girl described by Stevens as the ambassadoress from Elfinland, or the spirit people, when he visited Daphne's home in Brooklyn in late 1858. I'll finish with um, the kind of obituary which was written for Daphne, and I presume it was written by his great Tipperary, well, John O'Mahony wasn't a Tipperary man really, if we take it seriously, he was born outside the boundary. Um, but in Seth and um, Dahani, the Irish language, the Fenian Brotherhood, newspapers, journalism, this was their avocation in America. Now there was a feeling, of course, that Dahani's body would have been brought home, like O'Mahony's was and like McManus as well, but that was never to happen. And I'll, I'll, John O'Mahony wrote uh, this tribute in the Irish American. The struggle is over at last. The weary heart of the exile will throb no more with the agony of hope deferred. The tiling brain is at rest. Over the quiet grave in Calvary Cemetery, let no memory of doubt or contention hover. Let him who sleeps beneath be remembered only by the good he did of Strofer and the common faith and love that make our world divided race one in heart and purpose. Now should, now should those he has left behind be forgotten when his countrymen recall his memory with respect. They partook of his sufferings even as they shared his love. The tempest of persecution that met him a wanderer tore them also from the secure anchorage of home. How desolate that broken circle is now those only can tell who, like them, have seen the last of their household gods shattered upon the heart which their presence has been atified in every vicissitude. And I'll finish with that tribute from John O'Mahony to his friend uh, Michael Dahani. And thank you uh, for your attention. <laughs>